you know, when we when we talk about how hot light cables get, it's important to understand why they're getting hot and how they're getting hot. And a lot of people don't realize, but you know, we assume hotness or, or temperature to be mostly conductive, right? If you touch something and there's contact, there's heat, and that's what's hot. But in the event of, of a light cable, the phenomenon is actually a little bit different, which is interesting. Clock in, scrub up, and join us behind the red line. You're listening to First Case, a perioperative podcast bringing you exciting interviews, engaging discussions, and innovative solutions that are changing the way patients receive surgical care. Each episode, we talk to frontline staff, perioperative leadership, and nursing entrepreneurs from across the country as they share their stories, experience, and expertise on the industry we love. From the back table to the boardroom, from wheels in to wheels out, we tackle the real-life issues affecting the OR. Whether you're tuning in for surgical service education or inspiration, we're glad you're here. And now it's time to roll back and start the first case. On this Vendor Spotlight, we speak with Kamal McNasia, VP of Clinical Development with Jackson Medical. And Melanie, we're going to be talking in the theme of the week, which is fire safety and fire prevention, and really talking about a solution that's going to help prevent surgical site fires related to the use of fiber optic cables, typically connected to a scope in the middle of surgery. Yeah, when I met Kamal at AORN, and he showed me Glow Shield. I thought it was a fantastic product, and I was really surprised that I hadn't seen it already and that we hadn't been using it because it really does do a great job, I think, at helping prevent those fires and helping protect our patients. All right. We're going to be right back with an interesting story about how Glow Shield came to be with Kamal McNasia, VP of Clinical Development at Jackson Medical, after a short break. A 17 Studios production, you're listening to First Case. Joining us now is Kamal McNasia, VP of Clinical Development at Jackson Medical. And we've got a very interesting story for you today. Kamal, I'm so excited to have you on. We're going to be talking about Glow Shield, but honestly, I think the story of how Jackson Medical brought this product to market is really intriguing and one that maybe people out there that have budding aspirations of, hey, I've got a really cool idea that would help us, something that might give them some inspiration or that little extra drive to move forward and bring a product to market themselves. So, Kamal, thanks so much for coming on the show. Yeah, I appreciate you guys having me again. And with this being kind of the tail end of Fire Safety Week, I think this this fits in pretty well. Yeah, you know, we've put out a lot of content this week because obviously fire prevention, fire safety, this is the sweet spot for what you're doing and the work at Glow Shield. And I'll even say I've worked in the instrument repair business for many years in the past, not so much in my current role, but the equipment that we're going to be talking about and the fiber optic nature of them is very familiar to me. And so we'll we'll get into that. But I thought maybe just to start, you could tell Melanie and I and the audience a little bit about yourself and your background. Yeah, absolutely. I come from an engineering background predominantly and serve as VP of clinical development here at Jackson Medical. And our flagship device is Glow Shield. It's a pretty neat little device that we'll go into a little bit more detail about. But really, I, a lot of the work I've been doing as of late has been working with clinical staff leadership within the surgical services departments and, you know, thinking about patient safety, thinking about quality, thinking about compliance, thinking about how our product fits in with all of that and provides value from a patient safety and surgical fire safety perspective. Well, I think it's time we just talk about the story, how Glow Shield came about. And I think I'm going to go ahead and throw out a spoiler, but I think the most interesting part of the story to me is that when you began to explore it, you didn't really expect to find anything. So what an interesting development. How did you even start going down this path? Yeah, yeah. So interestingly enough, you know, our team at, at Jackson Medical, initially, you know, we're all engineers and we started out in the Georgia Tech ecosystem in the biomedical engineering department. And basically, our main focus at that time was trying to find unmet clinical needs and providing 
intuitive value-added solutions and translating those solutions into the market for clinicians and for patients and for everyone, caregivers, to benefit from. And so we were looking around at different surgical environments. We were doing a lot of clinical immersion activities where we would put on some surgical scrubs. You know, we'd be in the corner of the OR, but we'd just be observing, just looking at different surgical techniques, different surgical challenges, problems, workarounds, how are teams interfacing with each other, how are they interfacing with the processes, and how are they interfacing with the existing equipment that they're already using. And so we were doing this in another field. We were doing some work in ortho, but someone had let us know that, you know, that these light cables get hot and that there's just in general a surgical fire risk in the OR. And for us coming from the outside, you know, we'll be we'll be the first to admit originally we didn't really believe it. You never really hear about surgical fires breaking out in an OR or patients getting burned. A lot of that information is oftentimes kept understandably so kind of under wraps. There's settlements and, and all these legal things that happen in the event something catastrophic happens where a lot of those details aren't shared. It was interesting for us because one day we we had known about this problem, but we weren't really focusing on it. And then we were in the ORs and we 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 noticed something very interesting when we were in this clinical immersion activity where we saw a surgical team where they were doing a bunch of laparoscopic cases throughout the day. And we repeatedly saw the light cable continue to get placed on the patient's drapes over and over and over again. And at the end of the day, we asked, you know, hey, are there any safety concerns with using these video systems or these light systems just for our own benefit? And everyone in the room chimed in and said, oh, yeah, you should never put that light cable on the drape because these things can burn so quickly. And at that moment, we realized aha, this is an opportunity. This is very interesting because there's what people know. It's the knowledge aspect of it that everyone is aware of, but the actions don't always translate over. And so, you know, once we did a little bit bit of digging and we started asking around, and really when we went to our first AORN conference, I want to say it was like 90 something percent of the people, all the nurses that came up to us were just like, oh my gosh, we've seen these burns over and over and over again. And, And this happened last week or last month. So, a lot of that kind of, you know, conference area activity really bolstered the fact that these 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 burns happen and they happen often and they may not be burns all the time to the patient, but the near misses happen even more. And those are oftentimes very underreported, just like the burns themselves. Yeah, you can sign me up. I can be one of those nurses who's like, yep, <laughs> seen a burn. <laughs> I've burned my hands on those things. I've um, yeah. seen burns in the drapes and they get hot. They get really hot. And Something that you're, I think I like what you said, how there's what we know and there's what we do. And um, it doesn't always match up, even though we know that there's a risk with those hot cables. That's right. Yeah. And you bring up something interesting, too. It's not only are we seeing burns on patients, but or even near misses with the drapes. But yeah, we'll run into folks every now and then that'll show scars, you know, either, either on their hands or we were at a conference and, and a surgical resident was like, oh, yeah. Like a month ago, I got burned right on the belly and she didn't realize and she was just leaning up against the light cable. And within a few seconds, she like, you know, jerked away and realized it had gone through her scrub top. So, oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit. I mean, obviously, you were really kind of laying out that state of the market, right? But I want to put maybe some statistics behind that and specifically you know, the fact that a lot of these are underreported and I know, and I know you said that like a lot of times the legal aspects of things, but I think even what you just said is sometimes like the burn happens, but nobody necessarily goes to Auk Health because people don't want to file, you know, any kind of incident report. It's a lot of paperwork. They have to leave work and go over. So they minimize the impact of that. And I didn't know if you wanted to build upon that a little bit, because I know your mission is really about creating a safer standard of care. And again, we have this big emphasis of, of content here during fire prevention week, but you know, I thought maybe you could, you know, really tell everybody why it's a bad idea to minimize those situations that result in that underreporting and, and add anything else to that conversation, as well as tell us about what you've been doing all week for Fire Prevention Week. Yeah, that's a that's a it's a great question. And and really as as you mentioned, our central mission is really to kind of establish a safer standard of care. That's our goal, that's our mission at our at our company, and and we're really at the intersection of patient safety, risk management, quality, compliance, all these things that 
or sometimes when you're in the thick of things, you're you're in the middle of the case can sometimes be be dismissed just because you're trying to get the case done. You're trying to get get the patient out of the room and 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 move on to the next case. And at the end of the day, we need to kind of continue to keep in mind that you know, hey, we're here for the patient. We're trying to do what's best for them. Why should people not minimize? you know, the issues, you know, of when they have a burn like that, they don't want to go to Oc Health, don't want to deal with that. But what's the impact on the industry when they don't do that? And maybe any other details around underreporting? Really, it's a question of quality reporting. When we're trying to achieve zero harm for the patient, which is a big theme that we've witnessed in healthcare and in the surgery field for the past couple of years, Really, that boils down to knowing where your problems are and making sure you're de-risking along the way in a proactive manner. The last thing you want to do, especially from a zero harm perspective, is to wait until, you know, something bad happens and then and then you're taking more of a reactive approach rather than a proactive approach. And so this is where even if it's a minor thing, even if it's a little hole in a drape and thankfully the patient didn't get burned, you know, you may not need to do a full report on that. but at least letting, at least documenting it in some way. So you're tracking some of that information because these are all data points that once you start to track, you'll start to get a feel for trending. And of course, the the root cause of it all could be, could be variable. It could vary from hospital to hospital, but getting a sense of that trending is important because then you're able to identify proactively that, okay, you know, we may be experiencing a shift here and we need to recorrect or redirect how we're doing things or maybe introduce a solution like Glow Shield that helps with minimizing that patient harm proactively. And so it's important, right? It's 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 what you know, it's what you don't know, and then it's what you don't know that you don't know. And so it's it's important to have kind of a good frame of reference for all, for all of that. I think we'd be really surprised if we actually started keeping track of all of the times we had a burn in our drapes. Even if it was a tiny hole, it didn't cause a huge fire. But how many times do we actually singe those drapes or burn our fingers? And how often is that really occurring? I mean, I think we'd be surprised if we tracked it. Yeah. And, and you know, there, there are studies out there that try to do a good job of tracking that. And it's tough. It goes back to the reporting and what we talked about in the other podcast episode about the state by state requirements on sentinel events you know they they estimate it's around 650 a year but you know there are studies out there that are extrapolating and they're looking at it at a from a different angle and even some of them are saying hey you know this could be four times as much for surgical fires in general where light cables account for up to like 38% so it's it's sizable i mean just based on the fact that you know all of the nurses we've ever spoken to have witnessed something like this happen. It's, 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 it's pervasive. Well, and I think the reason to report is highlighted, especially just because you kind of stumbled upon this information. You went searching for an opportunity and, and this is when it presented itself. But you, you know, if that data had been out there, not that I would have wanted anybody to beat you to the market, Kamal, but at the same time, if that data had been out there, solutions would come quicker because people would recognize the issue and that would present, hey, this is an opportunity for us to do better in the industry. And so I, I really want to emphasize that, but I also want to kind of go into, okay, you said something else as you talked about just kind of your mission as you were doing this at Georgia Tech, which was to find intuitive ways to solve the problem. So it's one thing that we get the data and we see this issue and we know that it has to be improved and maybe we're underreporting it because we don't want to fill out an incident report and go to Oc Health and maybe all those dynamics are happening. But a solution could come forward, but then it could also be very difficult to use. So there's the whole second phase of this. And Melanie will talk a lot about this as you really try to give everybody you know, kind of an understanding of how easy Glow Shield is to use. But if it's not easy to use, you might have the best solution in the world. But if you don't have the data to show that it's really a problem and you bring the solution forward and it's not easy to use, adoption is still going to be low and you're not actually going to create any kind of change or have any kind of impact for all of that effort. And so ease of use, maybe we run into that, but give us the general design of Glow Shield, so people can begin to understand how easy it is to use. Yes, it's it's incredibly important to have a product that is that is easy to use, as you mentioned. At the end of the day, you know, we we talked about change management a little bit in in the previous podcast episode as well, and 
And oftentimes big changes are, are, are harder to swallow, but solutions that provide maybe incremental changes or value add from a workflow perspective, where maybe your workflow becomes a little bit easier. Those types of solutions are always well received and well adopted. And so Glow Shield effectively is a shield, or you could almost call it a, a cover or a cap for fiber optic light cables. This is covering the distal end. This is the scope end of your uh, fiber optic light cable that connects to the scope. And oftentimes when these disconnections are happening with the scope and the light cable, either planned or unplanned, for example, if the, if the light cable accidentally becomes disconnected, this is where Glow Shield provides a lot of value because it automatically covers the light cable. And so imagine a device, and we'll have kind of GIFs and, and videos and stuff that we'll link, I'm sure, where the audience members can go ahead and check it out. But the product's very straightforward. It comes in its own little peel pouch, pre-sterilized, like any other surgical disposable. The surgical tech and the circulator will work together. They'll identify and understand, hey, we're using a light cable in this procedure, whether it's laparoscopic or arthroscopic or cystoscopic procedures, what have you. They'll open up a glow shield with the rest of your surgical disposables. And what they can do is right when that light cable comes out of that sterile tray, you can go ahead and cover it with the glow shield, nice and flush on there. And then you can leave it on for the rest of the case. You can finish setting up the back table, however you'd prefer. And then when you do your sterile handoffs onto the field, you know you're protected. You have that peace of mind that the light cable is covered. Even in the event that the light source accidentally gets put onto a full 100% and it's not connected to a scope on the other end, you have that peace of mind. There's that added layer of safety during that handoff. And so what about when we actually do the case? Is it going to get in the way? <laughs> That's a great question. And, and actually, when the case begins, and maybe the surgeon or the resident or the PA or the surgical tech needs to connect the light cable to the scope, the glow shield doesn't have to be taken on and off. It's not like a regular cap. You got to uncap, cap, uncap, cap. That That's not how it works. That'd be way too many steps that would disrupt the workflow and the surgical technique that would not provide a lot of value to the end users, to the clinical team, or to the patient. What's great about glow shield is actually it has shape memory. And so simply the glow shield stays on the light cable. It flexes away to be able to make a connection onto the scope. And then anytime the scope is disconnected because of that shape memory, it automatically and reliably rebounds back to be to, to shield that light cable. So it's very intuitive, very elegant, very, very easy to use. Yeah, I was picking up on intuitive there. I'm like, that's that's nice if it will just do the work for me and it's there and I don't have to think about it. But I know that it's so solving a problem and preventing a potential risk. That's good for me. My other thought, though, does go to it's small. Is it like what colors do they come in so that we can see them? We can count them. Should we be including it in our count? These are the things that I think of as a circulator. And those are and those are important things to to keep in mind. And and we've we've built in those those features into the design process and into the design of Glow Shield because we understand that as a patient safety device, we don't also want to be introducing other additional risks into the OR. And so counting is 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 a big question that comes up for us because retained surgical instruments and devices are, are a big challenge and and not only open procedures, but certain minimally invasive procedures as well. So the counts are incredibly important. And and we normally leave that up to the discretion of surgical leadership and how they want to handle it, but we recommend it. Once again, goes back to you know what we're trying to achieve is is safer surgery, right? So it's okay to have a redundant kind of solution there where you are putting glow shield on the count sheet. But glow shield in and of itself is radio opaque and x-ray detectable, which offers a ton of value from the retained surgical instruments perspective. Additionally, our glow shields have come in sky blue for Storz and Stryker light cables and orchid for Olympus. And so the coloring kind of helps out with keeping an eye on things as well. I have another question because I have lots of questions about things. We count it. We want to make sure that it gets taken off at the end of the case, that we get rid of it. And But sometimes things get missed. Sometimes things, you know, get left on and they get sent to SPD. What's the process for that if that happens? We we, we pride ourselves on a couple of things. And one of those things is, is working with staff from a cross-functional perspective. And so anytime we're introducing Glow Shield for the first time, even if, if it's for an evaluation or we're actually doing a rollout, we like to get multiple departments involved in one department that's instrumental in making sure surgery is safe is the SPD department. And so 
And so in this situation that you described, Melanie, what we try to do is train surgical techs and circulators to keep an eye out for that count sheet to make sure glow shield is tossed away in the room. In the event that doesn't happen, we also cross-train SVD department um, professionals as well to make sure that they are keeping an eye out for these light cables with glow shields um, in the decontamination stations as well. And so if they see it, they, they recognize, hey, this is a disposable item. We'll toss it so that the light cable can be adequately and properly reprocessed for the next patient. This way, we have two lines of defense, with the first line of defense being the surgical team that's remembering to toss it, and then the last line of defense being SPD that's checking uh, the trays in decontamp. Excellent. I like that approach to make sure that we educate everyone and make sure that everyone knows what's happening because sometimes the OR gets new equipment and SPD gets left out in the education process and they don't know what they get when it shows up in the case cart. And so I think that's excellent to have a well-rounded education program for that. Okay. My other question though has to do with the light itself, because if we leave the light on, we leave that power source on, that cable typically gets very, very hot. Are we able to leave the light on if we have the glow shield on the light cable? Yes, glow shield has been designed specifically for that event. Most folks don't realize is that the light cable, when it is fully illuminated up to 100%, the light that's emitted from there exceeds 500 degrees Fahrenheit, which is incredibly hot. And so this is this is super this is super hot stuff. And it doesn't take very long, as Melanie, as you know, it's it's it happens fast when you accidentally burn a person or yourself or the drapes. And so within six seconds. So so what we've done is, and we've also realized, you know, a light cable can in certain situations be left exposed in the field for a very long period of time. If you're doing a very long robotic case, for example, you know, and you're switching from laparoscopic to, to robotic, and maybe you forget to turn the light source off, those, are, those robotic cases can last for hours. And so we've included a safety factor in there where we've doubled, tripled the full amount of time that that glow shield is on that light cable. And it lasts at a full 100% for a very long time without any issues, no material degradation. And it continues to be safe to handle by the surgical team and it's safe to touch in the event it is on the patient. And at its core, the reason glow shield works is is really due to the uh, specialty engineered materials we've chosen and that we're using where the main heat shield is an aerospace grade material. So whether you're using an LED or a xenon light source that both technically get hot due to such high light intensity, the materials that are used are rated for much hotter temperatures to ensure performance and safety. You know, I'll tell you, I absolutely can attest to the fact that those temperatures are high. And I can also attest to the fact that the light cords do get left connected to the light source with the light source on for extended periods of time. And if you're wondering yourself, all you have to do is look at the end or that distal tip of the light cable or even where it connects to the rigid scope, and you may see a browning color where instead of a nice clear coating, all of a sudden it becomes a darker and darker honeycomb kind of look. And the reason that's happening is because the light cables and the light fibers that are coming from the light post on the scope all the way to the distal end to illuminate inside of the patient during the surgery, they're all made of thinner than hair strands of glass. And so to create those posts or those connectors on the light cables, they take these thinner than hair strands of glass and they bundle them and then they put an epoxy and then let that epoxy dry and then they essentially buff down the fibers to a smooth surface. So you might not realize that it's you know, thousands and thousands upon thousands of strands of glass that are there. But that epoxy originally has essentially almost no color. And so if you look at your light cables or your light posts on your scopes today and you see that browning, it's because that heat that is generated from the light source is actually melting and burning that epoxy over time. So, you know, just in case you're not a believer in what Kamal found and, you know, kind of like the underreporting, all you have to do is look at your equipment to find evidence as to whether or not this is happening in your facility today. Yeah, that's a that's a great point. I will I will preface that if you are doing that, make sure the other end of the light cable is not connected to the light source because you do not want to like <laughs> yeah. blind yourself with retinal damage because that <laughs> that that happens very quick as well. And Justin, I, I'm glad you you brought up kind of the composition of these light cables because I think it's important for folks to realize that you know when we when we talk about how hot light cables get. 
it's important to understand why they're getting hot and how they're getting hot. And a lot of people don't realize, but you know, we assume hotness or, or temperature to be mostly conductive, right? If you touch something and there's contact, there's heat, and that's what's hot. But in the event of, of a light cable, the phenomenon is actually a little bit different, which is interesting. Um, and the analogy I always provide is, you know, it's like the magnifying glass as you were a kid and you're playing with, you know, the sun's rays. You can get the rays to come down to a focal point. Imagine each one of those thousands of different little little fibers emitting a cone of light. And actually, there's it, all of those cones come together and constructively interfere and create a heating zone some distance away from the distal tip of that light cable. And that's why you can actually melt or burn a patient without having actual any physical contact with the light cable, which actually makes everything a little bit more kind of treacherous when you think about it, because you can control contact, but can you control ensuring that you're outside of that heating zone? That becomes a lot more trickier, and that's where Glow Shield can help because it provides that physical barrier and insulation between the fuel and the ignition source. You know, we talked about the adoption piece and and obviously not really being noticeable or often not noticed by the surgeons is so key. But here's what a number of end users have had to say. And I, I love reading these because I think, you know, just having the voice of somebody who's using it on the front lines is impactful. So I have a few of these I'm going to read, and then I want you to tell us about the white paper. But first quote, it's a simple and effective product that eliminates a huge risk to the patient. Very good product. This is Ken S., a surgical tech. Next quote from Lily F., also a surgical tech. Very easy to use, and I feel much safer with the tip of the light cord being protected. Great product, simple solution to a huge problem from Hillary B. and RN. Good product, excellent in helping prevent fires from the light source in the OR. This is Jesus, also an RN circulator. And then innovative and convenient. I would use this product for all cases needing a fiber optic light. And that's Jasmine, a CST. So, you know, that's the voice of the customer. But what I love about white papers is that we get a document that we can reference, especially if we want to bring a product into our facilities, we can share the white papers because that's often requested, especially in evidence-based purchasing methodologies that are out there everywhere. So talk about this white paper that we are going to have available as bonus content, along with some other information on the smartphone app for iPhone and Android. Yeah, these are some of the things that we're trying to do for Fire Safety Week and things we do across the board for all weeks of the year. And for us, we consider all weeks to be Fire Safety Weeks. And so these these white papers are, and this white paper specifically, is really an educational piece geared towards surgical fire safety. And at the end, of course, you know, we kind of highlight the fact of, about how Glow Shield can help with their surgical fire safety and and being a part of the protocol. One thing that we always suggest and, and like to emphasize, this goes back to change management in healthcare, especially when it comes to safety, it's always important to add layers without replacing the existing protocols and processes folks are comfortable with. And so not only in the white paper can you see this, but also when you start to work with our team, our specialists, when they work with you and work with educating the staff, educating your peers, we highlight this all the time about these different additional layers of safety that make everything a little bit more safer across the board. And so the white paper will cover things, for example, what are the common causes of, of surgical fires in general? How does the interaction between fuel, oxidizer, and ignition source create that perfect storm of a situation in the surgical setting that can result in catastrophic issues? We also highlight, we talk about peer-reviewed, a recent independently reviewed article that was published in Surgical Endoscopy, where some surgeons basically took an exposed light cable and took a light cable that had glow shield and ran it through a series of tests to see, will it burn? Will it not burn? And so what they found was that glow shield was super effective in, in preventing that interaction between the fuel and the ignition source. And, and they saw an over 400 degree temperature reduction with the use of glow shield, which is, which is awesome. It goes back to making it safe for contact and all that good stuff for an extended period of time. And so we hope that these educational resources like the white paper will be helpful in general for the audience as they make their way through Fire Safety Week and, and start to implement some of these strategies and new processes into their protocols. 
Okay, so speaking about implementing new strategies makes me think about the ways that we look at patient safety, fire safety, mitigating risk, all of these things that we do when we're either preparing for a magnet certification or a joint commission survey, CMS. I mean, all of these different agencies that we interact with. Is Glow Shield in alignment with all of these agencies? We are. We're, we're in great alignment because all of these agencies stress the importance of prevention and being proactive when it comes to patient safety. And Glow Shield fits right in with that. When you talk about Joint Commission or other hospital accreditation surveyors, you know, environment of care is always one thing they're always keeping an eye out for. And oftentimes fire safety is on top of that list for environment of care. And so to be able to show them that, hey, here is this proactive device and, and solution that we've implemented that's preventative in nature is great because you're not having to rely on mitigation strategies to correct for the problem after it's been after it's occurred or after that fire or that burn has happened. Additionally, you know, we've we've done a lot of work with hospitals, large, small, rural, metro. I mean, these light cables are used all the time across all these different specialties. And we've had a lot of a lot of great success stories that have come out of, you know, the past few years. You know, a few of them have had a lot of issues before they implemented Close Shield and introduced it with the light cables. And since then they haven't had any issues at all. In fact, one of our hospitals has been recording some of this data pre-Glow Shield and post-Glow Shield. And they actually retrospectively kind of look back and 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 are including it as part of a case study for their magnet redesignation, which, you know, magnet's a big, uh, a big deal. And not a lot of hospitals get that designation. And and one of the things they keep an eye out for is how are you being safer and what are new strategies or solutions that you've that you've implemented that that make a difference. And so I do want to remind everybody that that bonus content, the white paper, is going to be available if you've downloaded the First Case app for iPhone or Android. You simply open up the episode, click on the gift box, and you'll be able to view that and download the information on the white paper. Uh, you can also find the Glow Shield feature video and instructional videos as well on the website. Just go to glowshield.com. That's G L O S H I E L D dot com, and you can read. Reach out to them and schedule an introductory meeting. And so, Kamal, even more than that, they can request a trial. Can you tell them more about that? Absolutely. And what we also want to do is throw in another kind of resource for you all as well for the audience. And, and that's going to be a checklist that covers the top five things that you need to do to align yourself with uh, the AORN guidelines for fire safety under, under the environments of care from their recent guidelines. So we hope that's going to be another great resource. And yeah, reach out to us. We're happy to do an evaluation and support an evaluation at your hospital or for your surgery. We've talked about how intuitive the product is. You'll you'll be able to hear our world famous two or three minute long in service, which is always well appreciated by the staff that are looking to go, go, go. And so with the evaluation, what you'll get is you'll get access to our specialist who can come on site. We always like doing education with the staff and with SPD. So we'll do some light fire safety education with everyone and then pair in an introduction to Glow Shield and we can get, jump into cases, do some introductions to the surgeons to make sure they're well aware of, of Glow Shield and the benefit that it has on, on the patient's safety. And then we'll collect some data and we will and we can help out with the data presentation and delivery as well after the evaluation. So we really try to be partners when it comes to the evaluation and onwards being able to help out in any way we can. Well, Kamal said, reach out to them. Here's how. You can email info at glowshield.com. You can call 678-856-7454. Make sure you're following them on social media, LinkedIn, Facebook, and their Twitter handle is at Jackson Medical One. The educational resources that are on the website, as we mentioned, and here's a promotion. Just as we wrap up this interview, you can select to receive a free T-shirt when you download one of the assets from the website. And make sure when you do so that you mention first case to qualify. Kamal, really great interview, great work. I love the story. Anything you want to add before we wrap? No, just the uh, just the importance of fire safety week. We've we've been learning a lot through this week collectively as a community, and so continue to take those learnings and apply them and and make a real difference. And and just know that the Jackson Medical and Glow Shield team here are are always at the ready to support you and your staff and 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 your peers and your patients more importantly. And so we're we're here to help you in in your mission to make healthcare and surgery safer.
That was Kamal McNasia, VP of Clinical Development with Jackson Medical, talking about their product, Glow Shield, which has a great story and aligns closely with their mission to achieve a safer standard of care. And Melanie, you've seen this happen, and I know it's underreported. I'm sure you know it's underreported, and it's just one of those things that maybe the awareness isn't there, but the solution certainly is. And based on the conversation today, it's a pretty straightforward product that's easy to use. Yeah, I mean, it it makes perfect sense. And I think he really hit on something very important when he was talking about how we know it's a problem, but our practice doesn't line up with what we know is a risk or what we know that we're dealing with every day. And so they came up with an elegant solution that is intuitive, that is easy to use, and it doesn't get in the way. But even more importantly, it stays in place. Nobody has to take it on and off. You don't have to worry about it getting lost or going anywhere. It's there and it's constantly there doing that work, protecting your patient, protecting you, protecting everybody from that heat risk and that potential risk for fire. Yeah, I love that it's x-ray detectable and latex free. I think those are a couple of key components. I do want to remind everybody that we do have that bonus content on the smartphone app for iPhone and Android, specifically the white paper, but some other resources. And if you reach out to them directly, either by going to their website, glowshield.com, G-L-O-S-H-I-E-L-D.com, you'll be able to find all kinds of videos and resources there. But you can reach out to them by email, info at glowshield.com, or calling 678 856 Seven four five four. Certainly follow them on social media, but you can receive a free T-shirt if you download one of those assets from the website and are sure to mention that you heard about Glow Shield and Jackson Medical on first case. And then finally, those AORN guidelines, kind of that checklist, which I think can be enormously helpful as well. You can obtain that from them. That's going to do it for this vendor spotlight. As a reminder, you can help support First Case by subscribing on Apple, Amazon, or Google Podcasts. You can also find us on Stitcher, iHeartRadio, Spotify, or simply search for First Case on your favorite podcast application. We also have bonus content just like the one for this episode, but you have to download our smartphone app for iPhone and Android. And while you're there, we'd certainly appreciate a rating and a review because your feedback is important to the show. If you have any topics that you'd like us to cover on a future episode, or maybe you'd like to recommend a guest, just send an email to info at firstcasemedia.com. Thank you for listening to this Vendor Spotlight on First Case. First Case.